Hello and welcome to this video um, on my channel and today we are going to be talking about um, Apache Spark which is quite different from the videos I created before but um, actually I will create an entire video series on Spark internals and we are going to look at how Spark executes workload because as we go beyond um, using the API as developers, once we have the skills to create workloads, more than often we are faced with performance challenges and we need the <clears throat> knowledge and the tools to resolve them. And we are going to start at a very basic level and we are going to work our way through um, all of the details that we need to know to fully understand what happens if we schedule workload on a Spark cluster. And today <clears throat> we are going to do the very first step. We start right at the basics um, and we are going to look at MapReduce. And you may think now, okay, MapReduce, I know what it is. How does it relate to Spark? I wanna learn about Spark. But um, actually MapReduce is the foundation of all Spark workloads, even if you use higher level APIs. And it's also the level of parallelism that we achieve with Spark and Spark heavily builds up on top of the idea of MapReduce. And that's why we are going to look at it first in this short video, I'm going to keep it short. So let's get started. So MapReduce requires us to specify two functions. The first one is the map function and the map function has a semantic and the semantic is um, it acts on a single record so in the map function, we basically specify imperative code, um, meaning we write code telling step-by-step step what should happen on each of the records. And the map function creates a list of outputs and stores it in a file. And then we specify a second function, which is the reduce function. And the reduce function actually gets all records for a specific key. So the reduce function can act on many records and all having the same key. Um, and therefore we can um, implement aggregations there or yeah, logic which does not act on a single record, but rather um, on all of the records of a specific key. And as I already mentioned, MapReduce is basically a framework which is both declarative and imperative. Um, because the map and reduce functions are in a quite narrow framework which we use. So we specify a map function which has a semantic and a reduce function which has its own semantics and we cannot change them, we only can specify those two. And within these functions we basically um, write imperative code. So the framework doesn't know what's happening inside. And this fact will be um, interesting for us later in this video and also throughout the course as we look more into what Spark does on top of it. But that's basically the semantics of yeah, the MapReduce framework. It's also important to mention that we are already introducing partitions here because um, the map and reduce functions, they can be executed independent of each other because each of the instances of these functions um, handles distinct data from all of the other instances. So if we schedule three map functions on our cluster, um, they, they operate on distinct sets of values. And the same is true for the reduce function. There are no dependencies between the reduce functions themselves. Um, and therefore we can schedule them in parallel, but we need to make sure that we have our data split already so that we can have multiple instances running on multiple um, nodes in our cluster. So next I wanna, I wanna show you what happens if we schedule a MapReduce workload on a cluster and therefore I created this uh, small image here. So on the left side we have our input data um, which I depicted here as a stack of books and we already partitioned this input data into data splits. Um, and that's the um, principle of data decomposition. And that's, that's the fundamental principle for achieving parallelism. Um, also with respect to um, Spark. So we partition this input data into 
data splits. And in this case, I chose M, which is the number of data splits for the map function um, to be six. So we get six data splits. And then we have multiple instances um, of our program. Uh, one is special, which is the master. And then we have three map instances here. So what happens is the master is the central entry point to our program and it assigns tasks to our map workers here. And it also tells the worker which input split of the data the worker is supposed to load. And what's happening in the three um, map workers is they load the input data, their split of the input data, and then they're applying uh, the map function, which we have specified in our user program. And here we can see we are always dealing with one record, like with one key and one value. And we can generate a list of another key and another value. Um, and here, for example, this might be actual text. And then we, for example, we specify the map function that we're only looking for four words, dinosaur, panda, dinos uh, beer, and monkey within the text. And for each occurrence of the word in the text, we emit one key value pair. For example, in the, in the input, input split one, which was this worker here, handling we found these four occurrences and the map function specifies that it's supposed to emit these key values and the same thing happens on the other map workers and the master has to schedule six tasks because we have six input splits therefore we we have to execute the map function six times um, and in each of the map workers um, the output will be written to a file on disk um, that's basically a sequential write, but there's one important note here. These output, we call them map output files, are already um, partitioned by the reduce key. So to understand the reduce key, we have to look at the reduce fu um, functions already. Um, because the reduce key basically specifies which which um, values a reducer should work on and down here i have depicted the reduce function and here i said okay there should be two reduce um, workers so two reduce partitions and then we usually we take a hash of the of the key um modulo the the number of partitions we, we want to create to ensure that, that these values um, all map to the same key. So we want to have all pandas and all dinosaurs ending up in the same reducer, which can operate on these values then, so we can count them. And um, because we know we have all occurrences in that one single reducer, so he can apply the aggregation based on all data available from the map. And that's what's happening with the reduce partitioning function. And that's what I specified down here. So panda and dinosaur, would map to reduce key zero and beer and monkey would uh, map to reduce key one and they have different coloring schemes. So now that we understand this, we can we can continue here and say the map function writes an output file, the map output file, and this is already partitioned into the reduce keys. So for example, in the first region of this file, there end up only key value pairs of reduce key zero and in the second um, region of the file, there end up key value pairs with the reduce key one. And this also happens in all of the map um, steps and the other map steps. And now when the, when the map steps finish, they report the output file location to the master, which basically keeps track of all of the application execution. And um, so then the master can tell the reducer where to find the input files. Now the master waits for all map tasks to finish before he schedules the first reduce task to the reduce workers here. And for example, here for the first worker, he assigns a task saying, okay, you have to process um, reduce key equals zero. So, and it also tells the reducer where to find the respective output files. And that means the, the reduce worker um, can access these files, which are the map output files from the other workers, and basically read only the region where the reduce key equals zero. So he would only load these uh, red regions here from the files and basically fetch them in in an iterator. 
And then we may, may end up with um, this input if we load them sequentially top down. Um, and then what we see is we have to sort these key value pairs by the reduce key um, because we want to operate we want to create one key value pair for dinosaur and we want to create one key value pair for panda. Uh, therefore, the, the input here is sorted by the reduce key. And then we can apply, we can run the reduce function once for key dinosaur. And then we can run the reduce function a second time for key panda. And we basically only would count or sum up these ones here to find the word count. Um, yeah, and that's basically what's happening. Also in the second reducer, he got scheduled or assigned a reduced task with a reduced key equals one. So he would fetch the yellow file regions from the other workers, sort the input, and then apply the reduce function for each um, distinct key that he finds in his input data set. So here we create also two records. Um, we have the beer count four and the monkey count equals three. Also the key value pairs from the reducer function, uh, the resulting key value pairs of the reducer function are written to an output file so that they are accessible for um, subsequent MapReduce schedules. So, and that's how MapReduce works. It allows us to always specify a pair of a map and reduce function. And we can also combine multiple such pairs to implement more complex logic. Okay, one additional note on MapReduce. As I said before, um, it's a mixture of a declarative and imperative approach. So Map and Reduce are two functions which we have to specify. They are part of the declarative part, in a sense, because they have semantics and the framework knows how to execute them. However, what we write inside um, Map and Reduce functions is strictly imperative. So it's program code, which will be executed one by one, just how we specify it. That means, though, that the MapReduce framework has, um, has no understanding what's happening inside of our Map and Reduce functions. For example, in our Map function here, we would have, we would implement a filter and then we would implement another map which um, emits this key value pair for each of the words we find in our filter. But the framework actually doesn't know that we are doing filtering. And that's may, that makes the, the logic, so the semantics of our program, opaque to the framework. And that is actually what Spark is trying to tackle by, by creating or by providing more, more powerful and semantically um, defined, in a sense, declarative API, um, which under the hood maps to such MapReduce workflows. And we are going to see in the next videos how this is accomplished. Okay, if we look at Spark now, there is a slight difference, which I want to mention here already. So the workflow is quite the same, even though the, the things are called differently and it, it works a little bit differently if you, if you look at the code. But the idea is the same. However, if we execute a stage, which is basically the map in the MapReduce, um, <clears throat> it also writes an output file to disk. But in Spark, the difference is that the output file, the map output file, will already be sorted. It will not be sorted by the reducer but it will be sorted by the map tasks when it is writing the records. So we would end up with an output file like this. So the dinosaurs are sequentially in the file and then there's another key panda and then there's another region for another key beer and same for the other files as well. So this leads to, to the fact that our reducers, basically the next stage in, in Spark, doesn't have to sort these files before processing, but rather it fetches the respective regions. So all the, all the um, red records here from the map. And we don't need to sort the, all the records, but, but we have to merge the regions. So we wanna, we wanna merge this region having these two dinosaurs with the region having these two dinosaurs. And eventually with a region which has dinosaurs here, which we don't have, but we would merge these blocks together such that the records 
end up se um, sequentially in our input for the reduce function or for the next map stage in a sense. And yeah, that's basically the major difference between MapReduce um, approach and the implementation in Spark. Okay, to wrap this up, there is MapReduce and Spark is heavily inspired by the idea of MapReduce. Um, it uses the same technique for achieving parallelism, which is partitioning or data decomposition. Um, there's, there are slight differences be between the file exchange or the data exchange. And Spark, of course, it adds many, many optimizations and abstractions to the idea of MapReduce. That's why it is much more powerful. We talked about declarative and imperative nature of um, MapReduce and that MapReduce has no insight into um, what is happening within map and reduce functions. Therefore, we cannot optimize our workflows automatically because we don't know what the semantics of the workflow are. And Spark actually tries to solve this by providing higher level APIs which have semantic meaning and are therefore declarative. And it is also strongly encouraged, or you are strongly encouraged to use only declarative um, the declarative API because Spark can use these optimizations. We can have automatic optimizations because we know what's happening. The most, the most important thing is all workflows that we implement in Spark, even using higher level APIs are executed very, very similar to the MapReduce execution model. And that's why it's so important to understand this, especially uh, as we have performance problems or we, we, we would like to debug things, understand what metrics mean and so on. It's very beneficial to know this execution model. And that's it for the first part. So we covered MapReduce. Um, we are going to build up on this by looking at Spark Core API, which is RDDs um, in the next video. And on top of that, we will look at many, many more things within this video series. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you could take away something. Don't forget to like the video if you found it helpful or subscribe to this channel if you want to stay up to date with the next videos I'm going to shoot. Until then, thanks for tuning in. Bye bye.